Zach. Rob, good to see you, mate. Welcome to Video Hoarders. Thank you. Thanks for uh, coming on this very it's special nice. episode. One of the things I think about the Astra is that, you know, it's it's a whole experience. So the seats are part of the experience, the atmosphere is part of the experience, and when you come here, you buy a ticket for that experience. Welcome to the smallest bio box in Melbourne. These are your 35mm uh, and 70mm projectors. And the fact that we still have this sort of single screen entity which has operated since 1936 and people are coming to it habitually, and that's what I think everyone's always had a very deep passion about, is preserving its legacy. Call us tapeheads, a nostalgic breed of video hoarders. I'm on a quest to find some of the biggest physical media collections in the world. To find those long lost films that have only survived on the VHS format. So join me and my crew as we take a look at some of the most insane collections. Dust off those VCRs, it's playback time. Zach. Rob, good to see you, mate. Welcome to Video Hoarders. Thank you. Thanks for uh, coming on this very it's, special episode. It's, uh, you know, more celluloid hoarders than uh, it is bit, video, yeah. but uh, you know, any sort of visual, uh, we're very, very happy to show here at the, uh, the Astor Theatre. Yep. Let's go for a stroll. Yeah, yeah definitely. So, uh, yeah. yeah, this is uh, the main foyer space around here. So it's a fairly classic single screen picture palace environment. Uh, you got your old terrazzo floor. Uh, we have the Agent Coopers in the box office now, but uh, you know, <laughs> the best staff we have here, yeah. without a doubt. Everyone that has visited the Astor previously will know that uh, predominantly most people sit upstairs. There's 350 seats downstairs and 750 seats upstairs, so it's a, a, a big old place. Decent capacity. Yeah, very much so. How long has this place been here? Built in 1936, but it was actually a cinema before it was the Astor called the Rex, and before that, it was the Diamond. So there's been a, a number of different theatres occupy the space, but the actual location was a stables in the late 1800s before uh, it was deemed to be a, a, a theatre. It's always been theatrical. It's always had some semblance of cinema. Uh, had a little brief moment where it was a bingo centre for uh, a little while in the, uh, the late 1950s, early 1960s, uh, but uh, Everything has always revolved around the single screen. It's never been multi-screened. It's always been a, a theatrical environment that's had a matinee or an evening session. Uh, so that's really what's kept uh, the theatre going uh, for all these years. So, uh, and we're still doing almost identical programming to what they would have done in the, the mid-1930s. The actual outside foyer is quite opulent compared to the inside of the building. Uh, the actual inside of the theatre, whilst it's very pretty, I find the outside with the, the plaster work to be a lot more intricate, which is quite ironic considering that a lot of the older buildings generally have more ornate auditoriums than uh, foyers, but uh, you know, yeah. I think the carpet kind of speaks for itself. So it <laughs> definitely so does. Come on through. This really is the, the main focus point. What you're actually seeing there is the third screen that the building has. Uh, there's actually two more screens that are behind that screen. The wow. original screen from the 1936, uh, where you can see those three sort of columns at the moment. Yep. There's actually another three of those behind that screen that we're currently seeing. Uh, progressively, as sort of times changed and, and aspect ratios changed and, and auditorium specifications changed, the previous business operators brought the screen forward 
two times. So uh, you've essentially got three different layers. So original 1936, one that was put in in the mid 1960s, mid 1970s, uh, and then uh, the current screen, which we project on to this day, was installed in the uh, mid 1990s. Okay, right. uh, so uh, the original capacity of the building was quite higher. It was around 1,500, uh, lots more seats, uh, and that's predominantly changed over time. Most of the seats up here are still heritage listed. Wow. So we actually can't change any of the seating here. No way, so you can't actually replace them? Either. No, so uh, you can repair them, uh, but you can't replace them with modern recliners or modern seating, which is yep. the number one request that we have from people who have definitely suffered through uh, elongated movie yeah. marathons here. I usually uh, just bring a pillow. Hey, look, you know, BYO <laughs> is the best way to do things. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, the actual uh, seating here, along with everything else in the building, is protected by a very stringent heritage overlay. Uh, that's down to the paint and everything along those lines that have to be uh, repaired to a very specific set of rules and coordinations that you can't uh, get around because that's the heritage overlay protection. Wow. The only thing that's changed, if you go back and you look at some photos of the auditorium from the uh, late 1930s, early 1940s, is the uh, lighting fittings were changed in the 1950s. So these chandeliers were installed in the 1950s when Cinemascope came along because there was this idea that you wanted to have a, a grandiose sort of almost a uh, Roman setting uh, for, yeah. for Cinemascope. So the original Art Deco fittings were replaced in the mid 1950s yeah. and we were given these sort of uh, ornate chandeliers. So I might prefer one day if we, if we ever have the capacity to do it to get the original Deco fittings reinstigated. Uh, but at this stage, the, the concrete chandeliers are, are doing this pretty well. technology revolution that we missed was 3D, because uh, that again requires a different screen. Right. Yeah, yep. So we can do the old red and blue 3D, uh, <laughs> but uh, sadly yeah. that's been replaced by the, uh, yeah. the polarised filters and, yeah, and, and yeah, the yeah, different yeah. Uh, lens technology, and that requires you to have a, a screen that's uh, printed with a very sort of metallic surface uh, that will reflect more light from the projector bulbs. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Right. We can go up in the projection room if you'd like to have a look. Yeah, that'd be yeah, great. Still. So that means you can play um, Friday the 13th part three. If, yeah, if, if someone's got a, a red and blue print of Friday the 13th part three <laughs> and enough red and blue disposable glasses, yes, we that, can play it. That so. would be cool. <laughs> Oh, there's Jaws 3 as well. That Jaws 3, yeah. Nice. Uh, uh, the, one of the main uh, favourites was uh, Dial in for Murder in 3D, which used to be played here quite a lot. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah right. so, welcome to the smallest bio box in Melbourne. Uh, this, wow. this room is actually, funnily enough, built on top of the building, if that would make sense. It's almost as if they forgot to build the projection room. Wow. So they had to carve out an extra area of the building and, and, and instigate the bio box. Uh, so there's a bit of uh, urban legend on when that <laughs> happened, yep. uh, but there's been a constant sort of change in uh, the way the bio box was utilised and moved around. It used to play 16 millimetre. Obviously these are your uh, 35 millimetre and 70 millimetre projectors. Yep. And they present any sort of aspect ratio or format that you want to play on them. We have DTS, Dolby Digital. The only thing they can't do is Super 8 or 16 millimetre. The 16 millimetre projector uh, was pulled out a number of years ago. Uh, and that's uh, something that sadly isn't utilised too often nowadays. So uh, yeah. you have your original glass slide projector which whilst uh, you can see it's kind of being entombed by 35 millimetre boxes at the moment, but that, <laughs> that's because uh, that can no longer legally be used due to its uh, power wattage, uh, but it is heritage protected, oh, so right. it must stay there. Yeah, right. So we're uh, very, very big on it's that. It's so. obviously not very energy efficient. Would not be energy those. efficient today, so yeah, the hamsters that run the uh, power here would be, be very tired by the time uh, yeah, they yeah. have to power that. Wow. Uh, over here you've got uh, your more traditional uh, Barco 4K projector. Uh, that's what we screen uh, a lot of our uh, digital content on. Uh, predominantly all the 2K and 4K stuff goes through there. So, wow. um, yeah, and uh, the spot where this is sitting is where the 16 millimeter projector used to stand. And that was installed uh, quite a number of years ago now, but it's still one of the most robust 4K projectors you can get in the country. 
these machines themselves are really robust. Uh, they're kind of the standard 35 millimeter projectors that you would have seen in, in many cinemas around Melbourne and uh, Great Australia. That's uh, you know something that's a really good example of you know, machinery that never changes. Whereas you know with this, as much as we get a fantastic result from it, uh, there's constant server updates, there's constant firmware updates that need to uh, occur in order to get it working at its full capacity. This never changes. It's yeah. the, the essential uh, film loops and the essential uh, machinery is always what you get. And uh, you know, if there's an error, you know immediately what's wrong with it. Yeah. Whereas here, you have no idea what's happening if there's an error. Uh, and that's part of the digital revolution, and that's something that we we all have to you know accept and move on from. But I think the 35 uh, still really has a power, and it still really has a, a power with audiences. Um, we're seeing that at the moment. We're doing a 35 millimeter retrospective season of uh, Quentin Tarantino's films uh, in the lead up to his new film. And you know we're getting a tremendous response from audiences in that. But you know 35 is only viable if audiences support it because it does cost a tremendous amount of money to ship tremendous amount of money to operate uh, and there's a, a real investment in presentation which that you know is very hard to subsidize if you don't get the audiences for it yep. so uh, you know this is this is very good if you want to do things a little bit more esoteric uh, a little bit of a gamble uh, whereas the 35 millimeter prints at the moment we really like to present films we know are going to draw a crowd and we know we're going to have that community support because without it it's very different to justify running the 35 millimeter Yep. Cinema is changing incredibly rapidly at the moment. Like you know, it's, it, the, the the amount of content out there and the different ways to access content is, I think, uh, as open as it's ever going to be. It's only going to get bigger. And the fact that we still have this sort of single screen entity which has operated since 1936, and people are coming to it habitually to share in communal experiences of their favourite films or experiencing some new works, I think that's a, a real testament to the ability that people still like going to the cinema, the lights going down and the screen flickering in front of them and sharing the story communally. But that being said, you know, you do have to try to diversify as well. So, you know, whilst we, you know, do do repertory film screenings, it's predominantly what we do with the double features and the single screen matinees. Uh, we'll do live events. We do uh, a number of uh, live rescores. Uh, we've had a great success with a number of films having a musical complement live. Uh, and also things like the Melbourne Movie Market, which is a, you know, a community uh, program and a community kind of focused thing, looking at the genre community, the collector community. Again, treating the Astra as this vestibule for culture and how culture can converge on a location. And I think that's something that is uh, an area that cinemas in general aren't really engaging with. You know, you're not going to see a, 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 a collector's fair at a, a multiplex cinema. The idea is that the Astor has this sense of grandeur and this sense of community that has kept it going for so many years and doing these events really sort of exacerbates that and engages with the community at large. And that's something I think is really important to its longevity as well. One of the things to think about the Astra is that you know it's it's a whole experience. So the seats are part of the experience, the atmosphere is part of the experience, and when you come here, you buy a ticket for that experience. And that's what I think has really kept the building going. Uh, people coming back habitually for that experience. And part of the joys of the calendar is it always sort of works as a map in a way. Like, you know, you, you get your new calendar and you kind of work out, well, I want to go on this Sunday, then I want to come back maybe in uh, three weeks time for this Thursday session. And, and that, that is what I think has really made the building such a vital part of film culture in Melbourne uh, and also Australia wide. And even though it's gone through many different hands throughout the courses of the years, the main thing is that the building has stayed open. And that's what I think everyone's always had a very deep passion about, is preserving its legacy. Coming up next on Video Hoarders. Oh, cute. Oh, my God. <laughs> I love goats. This is great. The old uh, camp's light. It's pretty dark in there. Yeah, here we are. Whoa. 